Hi everyone, my name is Lee Janko from the London School of Economics, and I'm here to give you a talk on Chinese perspectives on Taiwan, and more generally, the ideas behind colonial expansion in the Ming and Qing dynasties. A lot of my work has been recently preoccupied uh, with the work of a late 17th century, or an early 17th century, late 16th century Chinese literatus named Chen Di who was very well known, especially in Taiwan, for writing Dong Fan Zi, which is the earliest written firsthand account we have of the pre-colonial life of Taiwanese indigenous people, that is the people living on the island of Taiwan. These were likely Sarayan people that Chen Di wrote about, although he doesn't specify. And I've done some recent work on Chen Di's piece, and some of this work uh, actually responds to a very widespread uh, criticism of Chandi's work in the existing literature, which argues that his account of these peoples exemplifies how the rhetoric of privation and primitivism, that is to say a rhetoric in which um, the indigenous people were seen as somehow inherently deprived or impoverished, and the rhetoric of primitivism, which sees the indigenous people as somehow behind that of the civilization, civilizational center that was China, um, that, that it exemplifies these kinds of rhetorics. And these express Chinese ambivalence toward the Taiwan indigenes. In Chen Di's view, according to Emma Dung, the indigenes thus lack the very basic elements of civilization. One, that is writing and texts and shu history because they lacked a calendar to mark time, so there can be no history, and li, ritual or propriety. Through these images of privation, Chen underscored the indigenous cultural inferiority in relation to the Chinese. But in my recent work, I've refuted this view. And in the talk today, I'm gonna to be giving some examples of why I think this is the case. And that if we understand Chen Di on his own terms, what we end up understanding also is the broader intellectual context in which such accounts about Taiwan were produced. So there's a very, very telling paragraph in Chen Di's Dong Fan Zi in the record of Formosa, in which he writes about the indigenous flavors in cuisine. Um, now, what is interesting about this passage, which I won't read out loud, you can read it on the slide. It is quite um, explicit and it may, turn, it may turn your stomach even today. Um, because this isn't something we're used to talking about. Um, but what's really interesting about this, pa this passage is that Chen Di actually reflects upon Chinese civilizational practices and argues that, well, when indigenous people see Chinese people eating certain things, they also have a, a, a feeling of repugnance, or they also have a feeling um, of repulsion. And he concludes from this, so who knows what the correct taste is and how can there be similarities in what people have a liking for? So in other words, he's actually being critically self-reflective here and arguing that in fact, there might be a more relativist position available on not just cuisine, but more broadly on social and political practices because it's here that the, the cuisine is operating in a way, it's gesturing toward a broader civilizational conversation about what civilized people do, read, where, live and how they live, right? I say more about this in my article on uh, Dong Penji, which I noted in the first slide. Um, but it's worth noting another very um, important passage in this um, where Chendi himself, he calls himself Mr. Unofficial Historian. He says, how extraordinary is Dong Fan? Now it's, it's quite telling that Emma Dung and Lawrence Thompson and other people who have translated this text often translate this line as how strange is Formosa, but it's also the case that um, much of what he talks about here when he mentions the word Dongfan, this is also translated by Emma Dung and Lawrence Thompson as meaning um, Eastern savages. And in fact, it can't grammatically function that way in most places in the text. There's a few places where it can, but um, actually it refers to the island itself. It's a geographic uh, place name and it can't grammatically function in any other way. Um, so this is further evidence that um, Chendi was not as chauvinist or prejudiced as um, he has been made out to be. And then in fact, he might in this passage be observing not the strangeness of the indigenous people, but their differences, noting that there have been other ways of thinking and living throughout time and space. And that these indigenous people, as well as the Chinese people simply represent one form of that. In fact, as I dug deeper and looked 
more deeply into Chundi's intellectual background, it turned out that he was connected in some way to a wide range of intellectuals operating in the late Ming, starting with Yang Shen, but also he was closely linked, Chen Di was closely linked to Jiao Hong. He, they were very, very good friends. And it was with Jiao Hong that uh, Chen Di lived when he returned from Taiwan. He was already in his sixties by that time. So was Jiao Hong and they were living together for a while. And this is where Chen Di was doing some very important scholarship, which I'll mention in a moment. But um, it's worth noting that all of these people, including we could also argue um, Li Zhi, all of these people were historians. They were all syncretists of the three teachings. Um, they were all interested in talking about indigenous or non-Chinese peoples in a relativist or a relatively tolerant way. That is to say, they weren't necessarily uh, straightforwardly enforcing norms of Chinese civilizational norms on others. Um, and they shared the characteristics of being historians. They were all syncretists and they were all contemporaries um, committed in some fashion to Yang Ming learning, which was, um, a, a form of learning taking place starting in the 16th century in China, which is typically not associated with the kind of empirical observation that we see in something like Chinese account. But they were also connected to philology and historicism. Yang Shen did not have such a direct connection to Wang Yangming. He in fact directly rejected it, but I think he shared other uh, very important characteristics with people um, in the Yangming school, which he himself would not admit, but I think it's um, the connections are there. Um, one of the reasons that recognizing this broader field of scholarship um, on non-Han Chinese peoples, including in, in Taiwan, um, one, of the prevent, one of the reasons that, that we haven't been able to say as much perhaps as we could, is that there's persisted a historiographical puzzle for a very long time that held that the Ming, especially the late Ming, when it came under the influence of doctrines from Wang Yang Ming learning, um, was more interested in self-knowledge and the authentic experience of the self and sort of aesthetic expression rather than the kind of empiricism, historical context and antiquarianism that would characterize later developments in the Qing dynasty. And as it, it turns out, Chen Di would be one very good example, but so too would Yang Shen or Jia Hong or Li Zhi or um, the others that I mentioned in the slide. Uh, just previous, there were actually a number of cases where people were interested in self-knowledge and authentic self-experience and the internal workings of moral knowledge, which were key doctrines of the Yang Ming learn the school of Yang Ming learning, but they were also, as it happened, interested in empirical observation, accuracy, text, text criticism, and, and the authentication and investigation of historic texts. So these things actually went hand in hand, despite centuries of historiographic claims to the contrary. In fact, um, I, my wager, I, I argue that in the Wang Yangming school, we see a turn to particularity that was driven by Wang Yangming's own philosophy, which tends to underscore the universality of human nature and thus of human values, but his emphasis on self-examination and authentic experience as a means of discovering moral truth encouraged the exploration of divergent ways of living among many mid to late Ming uh, literati. This turn to particularity, I argue, encouraged empirical investigations, which led to the acceptance rather than rejection of non-Han Chinese ways of life. Chandi himself emblematizes this turn to particularity. I've already discussed his account of the expedition to Taiwan and the Dong Fanzi, which was completed and published in 1603. But if you look here, this is the a screen grab of his English language Wikipedia entry. Um, we know that he was known not only for the Dong Fanzi, but also for a work on the ancient rhymes in the Mao Odes, oh, the Mao Shugu in Kao. Um, and these are painstaking analyses of rhyming schemes in the Shijing um, and other texts, including the Yijing and the Laozi. Um, now it's significant, I think, that Chen Di is known for writing in the preface to this work, which he started soon after returning from Taiwan, um, that there is past and the present, there is the North and the South. It is only inevitable that characters evolve and sounds change. Um, I think that much of his approach to accepting difference, not only across time, as in the case of historical sound change, for which he's well known for, for providing some of the earliest and most rigorous set of evidence, but also for his acceptance of non-Han Chinese ways of life have to do with the intellectual legacies of Wang Yangming. Um, let me discuss briefly his investigation of the ancient pronunciation of the Mao Odes to demonstrate what I mean um, by this. 
So this was this text. It's it's not an obscure text. It's very very well known. It was widely heralded as a watershed for text critical study um, by Guillaume Wu among others, but also by contemporary um, Anglophone and Sinophone scholars who are interested in philology. It was completed in 1604, right after Chen returned from Taiwan while um, living in the home of his friend Diao Hong. Um, and Diao Hong was, was known for his association with the Taizhou School of Yangming Learning, which was a radical branch of Yangming Learning. So it's quite significant that this um, influence was prevalent as uh, Chen Di is writing a work that is supposed to be systematically opposed to especially Taizhou radical interpretations of Wang Yangming Learning. Um, but why it's relevant, I think, to the larger question of Taiwan in the intellectual discourse of the late Ming is that um, Chun applies much of the same kind of contextualist argument to the sound of the ancient past as he does to the cultural practices of non-Chinese peoples. So in the case of the Mao Odes, which were an ancient text of poetry, some of which dated to the Zhou dynasty, which is like 12th century BCE, he argues that responses to situations as well as pronunciations of words were spontaneous and contextual. They did not remain the same throughout time or space. Um, as I noted in my earlier, in the Wikipedia entry, I have my own translation of that passage here, for time has passed and present space has north and south. Written characters have transformations and reversals. Sounds have changes and shifts. This is inevitably how things go. So using today's sounds to read ancient types cannot avoid obscured absurdity. So although in his time and place for Chen Di, the rhymes and the odes and the Shi Jing um, in this book of poetry were typically read as sort of near rhymes. People would sort of make up pronunciations for them because it was pretty clear they were supposed to rhyme, but they didn't in contemporary pronunciation. Chen would gather evidence against this reading by recognizing differences between ancient and contemporary speech. Because up until that point, for the most part, people did not recognize that ancient people spoke a different version. They pronounced the characters differently than contemporary Chinese people did. And Chen Di was one of the first people not just to make this observation, but to actually document it across time through um, comparative examples from contemporary and ancient texts. Um, I argue that actually he's getting um, this turn to particularity or contextualization of ancient sound from Xin Shui or Yang Ming learning, um, which did not desacralize canonical texts as it's often held to do, but it encouraged them to view these texts in a new way. Um, and this defies typical historiographical perspectives of the move from philosophy in the Ming dynasty to philology in the Ming in the Qing dynasty. We might compare something like Chen Di's work to that of Yu Yonghe, who was visiting Taiwan much later, about 100 years later in 1696. And here, I won't read the full quote out loud, but you can see that um, Yu Yonghe has a very assimilative cultural perspective on the indigenous people. He thinks that they can be fully assimilated to Chinese culture. Um, but the fact is that um, whereas Chen Di sort of saw them as separate but equal as people with leading their own lives with interesting comparative perspectives uh, to furnish to an external investigator, Yu Yonghe definitely sees them as objects of imperial assimilation where they should be made to become more truly happy and to become better people and to become more of what they really want and should be um, precisely by um, learning the ways of Chinese civilization. Um, this is my some. This is an example, a table from some of my broader work, in which I try to situate the work of Yu Yonghe, Wang Yangming, Chen Di, and others in relation to their perspectives on human difference um, across Taiwan, but also across the Southwest and Western China, where many non-Han Chinese people um, lived. Um, this is still in development, so I welcome your thoughts and ideas. Thank you very much. I appreciate very much your, um, your time and the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you.